good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. How do we attract medical students and physicians to primary care? Most countries in Europe are trying to improve their primary health care systems. That's really a reform priority, which we see in many, many countries. But, one, but among the biggest barriers to, uh, to move forward is the health and care workforce crisis. Countries are plagued with shortages, maldistribution, medical deserts, skill gaps, just to name a few problems we are encountering. And we are encountering these problems even though we have unprecedented numbers of health workers in most of our countries at the moment. But there's still a failure to attract and to retain primary health care workers. So, the good news here is that the health and care workforce crisis is high on the political agenda, both in countries, but also internationally. Four weeks ago, WHO Euro organized a high-level conference in uh, Romania, and they issued the Bucharest Declaration, calling for immediate action addressing the health and care workforce crisis. And two weeks ago, in uh, Geneva, WHO headquarters run the Global Forum um, on Human Resources for Health, addressing various issues globally on the health and care workforce crisis. The health and care workforce crisis has many, many aspects, but today we are zooming in on primary care. And of course, there's a lot to talk about the problems, but we are a little less interested into the problems. We want to focus on solution. We want to understand what are actually the policy options that can be chosen by uh, policymakers. This webinar today on attracting med medical students and physicians to primary care is a first installment in a series of five webinars. Over the next weeks, we are planning to um, deliver another four webinars on the topic. The second one next week will be about the learnings from COVID-19, from COVID-19 responses with particular focusing on uh, the working conditions. The next one will be on working with education, finance, and employment, so the intersectorality, how we relate to other sectors, how we work with them together, that they really understand health systems needs and de demands and can respond to this. This will be the focus of the third um, webinar. The fourth will be on the money. Where do we get the money from and how do we smartly invest the money into the health and care workforce? And last but not least, we are planning a webinar on the skill mix, a more complex a more complex topic, but certainly one of the tools in the toolbox for addressing the health and care workforce crisis. Focus today will be on Europe, but uh, for the coming webinars, we will also introduce the global perspective with international speakers from outside uh, Europe. And uh, we have uh, secured the attendance of Jim Campbell, who will come on board as a discussant and commentator. Jim Campbell is the director for Human Resources for Health at the WHO headquarters. Today's webinar is based on a policy brief which portrays the situation uh, before COVID-19 and it's based on an extensive literature review at the time, the largest and most comprehensive literature review, which not only looked into the um, peer-reviewed publications, but also included a lot of gray literature. And uh, unfortunately, the first author, Marike Person, cannot be with us today, but I'm more than happy to um, introduce my colleague, Deepa Rajan, who is a co-author um, uh, of the policy brief and who is actually a health system specialist and has published and worked on the topic extensively. And uh, we are very keen to hear from her some of the key messages coming actually from the policy brief and also presenting the policy options. I'm also very happy to introduce Ilana Ventura. She's from the Ministry of Social Affairs and Health and Care and Consumer Protection from, uh, from Austria. And I'm very happy that she's with us because actually she's been uh, part of the group commissioning the policy brief because Austria has embarked on a bold primary care reform. And one of the issues they were confronted very quickly was the, the uh, unattractiveness or the, the, con the perceived unattractiveness of primary care um, sector. And we were wondering how can we address this? What are actually the policy options to make it more attractive? 
I'm also very happy to introduce Pia Frakro from the National Public Health Institute in Slovenia. And you probably all know that Slovenia has a quite uh, elaborate system of primary health care. Um, but Pia is not only a great uh, researcher and scientist, she has also been for a while Secretary of State for Health in the Ministry and overseeing public health and primary care. And last but not least, I would like to introduce you to my colleague Gemma Williams. Um, she is today um, managing the poll and the chat box. Um, our colleague, um, Erica, who's usually looking after the poll and the chat box is on, on, on leave at the moment. Just a couple of words on housekeeping. Please use the chat box to put in your questions, comments, remarks, whatsoever. They are not lost, actually. We will use your comments, your input, in the panel discussion at the very end, Gemma and me, we will feed back your questions to the speakers and hopefully you will get really good responses. Second, what I want to say is um, this session will be recorded and we are recording this because uh, two or three days after the webinar, um, the video of the session will also be available on YouTube. So that's my setting the scene and introduction. And now Gemma, can I ask you to start the poll, please? Hey, good morning, Matthias. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Lucy, could you launch the poll, please? Right, so we're doing a poll today because we're interested in sort of learning a little bit about what different countries are doing to try and attract medical students and physicians to primary health care. And this poll is a two-parter, as you can hopefully see on your screen. Um, and question one, um, is is increasing the attractiveness of primary health care for improved recruitment and retention of physicians a policy priority in your country and this first question is just a single choice answer so please select yes or no and then the follow-up number two have any of the following policy options been tried in your country and this is multiple choice so feel free to pick as many as you like so it's making rotations to primary care a compulsory part of medical education, a compulsory service in primary care on graduation, increasing opportunities for professional development, uh, bonus payments for primary care physicians, uh, making investments available to upgrade facilities, or none of the above. And if you're selecting none of the above, it'd actually be really interesting to learn what might be happening in your country. So if there's something that we haven't included here, please pop it in the chat, because it'd be quite interesting for us all to be able to learn from that. So we're just gonna leave this poll up for a second for you all to be able to answer. And then we'll come back to it after the keynote speech and sort of uh, look into the results. Gemma, thank you so much for introducing the poll. And I think that the questions of the poll and the answers are already setting the scene what we are talking about because there are already some, some policy options in the, in the mix, actually. Great. So um, we are very curious about um, your responses and we will work with your responses over the course of the webinar. But now it's my great pleasure to uh, give the floor to my colleague, uh, Deepa Rajan. Deepa, please, the floor is all yours. Great, thank you. So um, I'm going to, as Matthias just said, I'm going to um, basically give you an overview of a policy brief that uh, we, we did a couple of years ago. It is pre-COVID. However, we have complemented some of the information with more recent in, uh, information that we have. Um, and analyses that we've done also for the Global Forum on Human Resources for Health that just took place earlier this month, and also looked at some of the uh, WHO guidelines that have come out recently that um, mainly reinforce the key messages that we had at the time, um, but don't sub you know, substantially change uh, the, uh, the messages. So we know that uh, what the challenge is, I won't go into this in too much uh, detail. Um, we know that we need stronger primary health care. We need to invest in primary health care for a number of reasons, better health outcomes, better equity, etc. Countries are going in that direction. And, um, and increasingly, we have more evidence that it really does have that PHC has um, a, a greater impact on health outcomes. Even if there's a wide heterogeneity and impact across the settings, the trend in the evidence is more than clear. But the workforce shortages that were there pre COVID and have only been exaggerated now um, with the COVID situation and exacerbated um, are, are dire overall, but especially in primary health care. And we'll see why in, in the course of uh, this presentation. So basically, the, the one of the biggest problems is that we have a growing number of specialists vis-a-vis 
uh, generalists across Europe. And in the next slide, you'll see the the the, the you know um, the dimensions of this. And if you look at the blue dots across the different countries, this is um, uh, you know this is basically the um, the the trend for the for the ratio of specialists to general practitioners. And you'll see that that trend is that the blue dot is going up and up everywhere, which means that we're getting we're having more and more specialists vis-a-vis -vis general practitioners. Um, this is data pre-COVID, but um, that trend hasn't uh, substantially changed. Next slide. And this is really, um, you know, it goes back to a number of issues, um, but we need to really think about um, the prestige of primary care or the lack of prestige in many countries of primary care because it affects the attractiveness uh, greatly. Um, many countries don't recognize general practice as a medical specialty, um, which means that in some places there's no additional training required to be accredited as a GP. Now, this really affects the perception um, and the prestige of, of the profession, and also not only vis-a-vis -vis patients and society in general, but also vis-a-vis -vis, um, the professional community, vis-a-vis -vis specialists. So specialists who have gone through that additional training um, in many places look down upon generalists, and this is a, a larger systemic issue. This is obviously reinforced greatly by pay differentials, and it's also linked to the scope of work that GPs may have. Because of the fact that they don't have the additional training, they end up multiply, you know, referring uh, quite a bit because they are limited in their scope of practice, which also um, you know, gives the impression and the perception to people and to patients that there's not much that a GP can do and they, you know, if, they're in, if they end up getting referred all the time um, anyway. So um, expanding the scope of practice, uh, for example, to do what um, primary healthcare should be doing, which is covering the vast majority of patients' based, uh, you know, essential health needs, um, also increases the attractiveness of primary care. And you will we'll be hearing a little bit more about that in our, uh, from one of our, from our spotlight speakers. Um, the next slide just shows the, uh, the extent to which there's a real disparity in pay. Um, I think this is, um, you know, the, it's extreme in some countries. You can see in Belgium, um, you have two and a half times the average wage for a GP and six times for specialists. That is a bit of an outlier, but you'll see across the board that the differential is quite, quite high. Next slide. So what do we do about this? What can we do to get people, uh, to get our medical students and our young doctors to really stay um, in primary care? Well, firstly, we need to start, uh, we have to have a multi-pronged strategy. Uh, one strategy alone is not going to do. It has to, we have to have a systemic approach, starting really at, with medical education. It plays an important role in increasing the attractiveness of primary care. We need to expose our medical students to the profession early. Uh, and ex for example, with uh, the presence of a family medicine department in the medical school. Uh, clinical rotations, placements, coaching, mentoring of students, curricula adaptations, decentralization of institutions or programs, scholarships to go to rural and remote areas. All of these things are really important to, um, to show medical students what it is like to work in primary care and to show that it can be rewarding. Um, next slide. And in, when it comes to these uh, educational programs in medical schools, um, what the evidence tells us is that you'll see that the effectiveness is, is limited when you look at single interventions, um, you know, such as electives or compulsory clerkships or integrated residency programs. But when we put them together into sort of a not long, longitudinal um, program, then um, there is a consistent association with an increased proportion of students choosing primary health care. So it's important to really look across the course of medical education, including residency residency and to be exposing students frequently um, at different points in time across the board to, um, to rural medicine, to primary care, to this, and to also to, to through that, to teach those skills that are needed um, for, um, for primary care and not only hospital care. It's not really clear, you know, what is the most efficient point of time to bring in an intervention. So really, it, you need to do it across the board and uh, repeatedly and over the co course of that career. Um, 
Now the ILO um, looks at, uh, divides work environment into employment quality and work quality, the ILO being the international labor organizations. And um, when looking at these different aspects of both employment quality and work quality, uh, the pre-COVID at least, the vast majority of the, uh, the, um, the literature was really more around the employment quality or it was around, um, it showed that employment quality had a def had a much um, had a showed that it had an effect on on the choice of um, students and young doctors into primary care. However, with the COVID crisis and more recent um, literature coming in, we have more and more documentation on work quality as well. Now, when it when we look at employment quality, wages are this is the major element really affecting the uh, attractiveness of the work environment for health workers. It's the major factor for rec recruitment and retention, but it is um, the major factor, especially in places with with fairly low salaries overall. So we need to get salaries up to a level where people can live off of their salary and where they can live comfortably and where it's um, sort of um, you know adequate in terms of the the type of education that they've um, invested in. But once you get to a certain level, it's not, you know, adding more on top of that is not necessarily enough to keep uh, people in primary care. So it needs to be combined with other factors as well. But um, so payment payment and wages is important, but it's not the only, uh, the only important factor. And um, an overview of 33 reviews um, again, pre-COVID did, um, you know, uh, really emphasizes that point, but also emphasizes that health professionals, in addition, respond very positively to mainly, um, you know, uh, issues around work-life balance. Um, you know, what can be broadly sort of put under the umbrella of work-life balance. This is an important issue, especially in view of the feminization of the workforce. We know that health, the health workforce, about 70% of the workforce is is female and um, you know, on, amongst physicians, there's an increasing um, number of, uh, of women in the workforce who tend to want to have more flexibility, who want to um, have periods of life where they potentially are able to work less. And um, um, one study among Dutch female general practitioners, for example, found that family-friendly practices such as flexible working hours allowed um, the system to keep these female GPs at the same level of work and the same number of working hours by just offering more flexibility. So that's one way of keeping them in and not you know, lowering their full-time uh, equivalent. When it comes to um, models of care, these uh, the way the system is organized and service delivery is organized has, um, you know, has a has an impact on on the attractiveness of primary care. And um, when it, for example, practice type, there's actually a uh, interestingly a strong difference between um, GPs, mostly related to age, on um, preference for solo practice or shared practice, and younger GPs preferring by far shared practices. Interestingly, you know, older GPs, even after you put them in a shared practice and ask them the same question a couple of years later, they are still less inclined to choose to work in a shared practice. So obviously they would prefer to work as they have worked already for the past few decades, but younger GPs really would uh, prefer to be in a shared practice. And this is also linked to um, multidisciplinary teams. Um, this is also seen as attractive for an, um, for uh, PHC, for primary health care uh, uh, physicians, because it reduces professional isolation. It creates a sense of community, creates training opportunities, opportunities for exchange with those who have, you know, different specialization or, or different kinds of training. It's about peer support. Um, and uh, clinical leadership is also uh, in within the multidisciplinary teams um, is, are also valued have highly by health professionals, especially by doctors working in community settings or in isol you know in isolated set settings where they're at risk for de-skilling. I think you can see a pattern here that really, you know, the, this issue of, of professional isolation, of having, being a part of community, having support is really, it's really key, especially for our young 
medical students and doctors, and that really increases the attractiveness of primary care. Um, so all of these um, issues, whether it be the practice type or the multidisciplinary team, they all sort of link back to that one, uh, you know, sort of issue being a part of that community and ensuring that there's no isolation. And this might be because, you know, in the specialist area, there's less risk of that isolation because specialists tend to all be, you know, at, you know, a couple of tertiary care institutions or in a capital city or have, are, are, are more likely to be together in a community physically anyway, um, whereas primary care providers are sort of dispersed throughout the country, often in rural areas, etc. Um, and uh, services in primary care. This is um, this is about the scope of practice, um, and and um, you know having the opportunity to collaborate with specialists and uh, and and other um, you know other professions. Um, for example, social care workers, et cetera, through integration of services has been found to improve the attractiveness of primary care for health professionals. And of course, career options and development. And this is again, also about the multidisciplinary team and, and the distribution of, of roles. And when there are more advanced roles for, for nurses in primary care, it, it uh, allows physicians to, um, to focus more on what they were trained for. Um, now, of course, physician associations in many places do um, resist uh, some of these advanced roles for nurses. But if, when asked, you know, when you know studies looking at um, the, the, the individual team members and their views on this, it tends to be more positive. Um, next slide. Um, workforce planning is, you know, may have little direct effect on THC attractiveness and primary care attractiveness. Um, you know, directly, but a more stable workforce, you know, is, is important for the work pressures and um, on the team as a whole. And so that positively influences the attractiveness of, uh, attractiveness of working in primary care. And we've, you know, obviously now in the post-COVID context, that is a key issue to be able to really plan, um, you know, your workforce pro properly, especially within the primary care sector. Next slide. Um, and, you know, the final strategy that I'd like to mention is, is really about targeted strategies for recruitment and retention in rural and remote areas. And here the WHO recently um, came out with, some, uh, with guidelines on rural retention. And for many of these um, measures that you see on your screen, the strength of evidence was, was actually graded as, as strong. So these are all areas that we knew that, that worked well, for example, um, you know, getting people with a rural background into medical school, for example, has um, uh, you know a very uh, consistently positive effect on on keeping on on keeping them in rural areas later on in their career. Um, however, that effect can diminish, diminish over time. So some of the other um, factors need to come into play in terms of of keeping them in rural areas, and. Um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll just mention maybe one other factor here without going into in, it in detail is that um, those you know, incentives in terms of keeping them in rural areas, they have to be, as mentioned earlier, financial, yes, but it needs to be combined with non-financial incentives. And that package of really putting the financial and non-financial incentives together is also was graded as a strong strength of recommendation in the WHO guideline is, is important. So it's about making sure that the wages are adequate and high enough, but then um, addressing those issues of isolation and lack of a, of a physician community and um, lack of, um, career uh, development opportunities, especially when you're, you know, when, when you're in a very remote area. So to, um, to end, I'd like to say, next slide, um, you know, that, uh, you know, they, obviously we need to look at this multifactorially, um, that, um, you know, although intrinsic factors play a large role in primary care attractiveness, and by that we mean things like the ability, the feeling that you have the ability to provide the kind of care that you would like to, long-term, direct, patient-centered care. Um, uh, you know, these are important factors. Um, they're hard, they're heavily influenced by some of those external uh, factors, uh, uh, working conditions, administrative workload, peer support, um, et cetera. So they need to be addressed. When it comes to medical school and educational programs, we need to really think longitudinally and exposing medical medical students throughout their, um, you know, their, their career. And um, employment quality is obviously one of the most important factors to address in terms of attractiveness of primary care. 
and um, and the PHC model and the PHC models that have shown to work um, and are the ones that policymakers would like to put in place are really the ones that also make primary care more attractive to the workforce. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, to end and next slide. Um, and again, if you're interested in more details, here's the policy brief, um, which is on the observatory website. Thank you. Deepa, thank you so much for this excellent overview. And, uh, you know, we're talking today about a very focused issue. You know, how do we get medical students and physicians into primary health care? And clearly what you say is actually, listen, even though it is a focused problem, the solutions and the interventions are much broader and multifaceted. So it's a systemic approach. You've been talking about a health systems approach, actually, that we need to have multiple, we need to combine multiple interventions. And you were also emphasizing the longitudinal pro, um, programs and education working conditions, and very important, the model of care. And I think this will take us uh, to contextual factors. You couldn't address this in your, in your overview, of course, but today we have two spotlight speakers from countries which will feed us in a little bit on the context, you know, and how to combine different uh, measures. You always were, you also were referring to, to the planning, so that um, this is actually something which starts very, very much from the beginning, from the planning, to the education, to the working conditions, to the context, and, and so on. Thank you so much, Deepa. And uh, this is the moment, actually, where I would like to ask my colleague uh, Gemma to present the results of the poll. I'm very curious, Gemma. Hi, thank you, Matthias. Um, so firstly, just say I've put a link to the policy brief in the chat, so you can all click on it and go and have a look after the webinar, of course. Um, so the poll results, I'm hoping you can all see them. Um, I was a little bit surprised at how close the first question was. So is increasing the attractiveness of primary health care for improved recruitment and retention of physicians a policy priority in your country? We had 53% of people saying yes, and then 47% of people saying no. So closer than I expected. And obviously, it'd be quite interesting to know whether that sort of is because primary health care uh, is not yet a priority in your country or if strengthening the workforce elsewhere elsewhere is more of a priority or whether there just are no challenges and primary health care is just has all of the professionals that it needs it would be quite interesting to dig into that a bit deeper then for the second short, uh, question have any of the following policy options been tried so the most uh, popular answer was making rotations to primary care a compulsory part of medical education and almost 50 percent of you that answered this question picked that as something that was happening in your country um, then a third of you um, picked bonus payments as well that was the second most popular choice uh, followed by increasing options uh, opportunities for professional development um, and just looking here, so the sort of the least common option, except for none of the above, was compulsory service in primary care on graduation. So over to you, Matthias. Emma, thank you so much. And as you say, I found the first uh, response also a little bit uh, surprising because uh, I can't hardly think of a country which is not focusing on developing primary health care. And of course, the health and care workforce is very key to this. And we hear so many problems and issues from countries attracting enough um, uh, health workers into, into primary health care, whether it is in urban areas or even more difficult in the rural remote areas. So only half of the countries in the perception of the audience are actually making it a priority. And then I think, you know, the answers, um, again, uh, they they kind of resonate a little bit with what Deepa was saying. It's not a not a single, single thing, you know, but you need to um, uh, integrate a multiplicity of um, different interventions and policy options to address this issue. And I think it will be very context dependent on what can really work in your country and whatnot. And I, and I hope that we get a couple of insights from the spotlight speakers now. Thank you so much, Gemma. And that's the moment where I would like to um, invite Ilana. Uh, Ilana, the floor is all yours. Hello, and thank you uh, for inviting me. Um, hello from Vienna. I'm very excited to be part of this um, webinar today. Um, I think that Deepa uh, already mentioned so many relevant points um, that is also really in the practical implementation in Austria uh, key um, in, in implementation. And I think, I think that the policy brief is really uh, very topical, even though it was written before COVID-19 and it might be even more topical right now. So um, 
I think that many countries face similar challenges when it comes to primary health care. And for us, one important question is also, when is the right moment to set concrete steps and implementation measures? For those who might not know, Austria has a quite fragmented healthcare system. So we have um, within the federal system, many uh, players, um, many decision makers, implementers. So it's not like that we have one institution that can um, you know, set goals and implement them easily. So we have um, agreed on a multifaceted or multi-layered strategy that is really necessary when you look at the different uh, aspects that need to be implemented and they really need to be implemented in parallel. So it's not one after the other, but mostly um, at the same time. And I try to really summarize a little bit um, main um, areas um, that are for us relevant at the moment. The first one, and I think that is relevant for almost any country is the political will. So uh, if, if the political will is there to strengthen primary health care, then that's the first step to go. We have um, it clearly stated in the current government program and also in the health care reform. Um, we want to shift away from inpatient care and um, shift towards outpatient and strengthen uh, primary health care. That's a clear declaration. So um, the second aspect is innovation. We are trying to create settings that are future oriented and also satisfying the expectations um, of uh, general practitioners, but also of the younger generation. Um, and these are many things that Deepa mentioned before. For the last few years, we have been um, trying to implement primary healthcare units uh, in Austria. Currently, we have 40 of these units and they are characterized by these multi-professional teams. So you have two or three uh, general practitioners working together with other healthcare workers, such as um, physiotherapists, also psychotherapists, um, midwives. We have also social workers in integrated in these teams. And um, the advantages are obvious, uh, especially for the patients, because they are um, they have extended opening hours, they have a broader range of uh, service deliveries, and at the same time that gives the team the possibility to really focus on their core tasks. Um, it gives more flexibility in the working arrangements and working conditions, and as was mentioned before, the important work-life balance um, is, is easier managed in these units because they can really work in teams and um, don't have the responsibility of uh, working alone in, in a single office. Um, and this is for us an innovative approach. And we also thought about an innovative approach to financing. So we were really excited when we were able to earmark 100 million euros from the um, recovery and resilience facility of the European Commission. So we have now this money in order to um, further strengthen primary healthcare in Austria uh, in the upcoming years until 2026. And here we have two streams of implementation. The one is going directly in funding primary health care. Um, and, and here we want to implement 170 projects, um, 110 in the existing primary health care setting, and at least 60 in newly developed primary health care units uh, in the upcoming years. And the second stream of this um, project uh, within the RRF has to do with a platform. We have um, established a primary healthcare platform, which is a hub of interaction, of communication, um, of um, information for the primary healthcare community. We believe that this is also an important step in uh, giving them the opportunity to um, inform themselves, to exchange ideas, to articulate also their interests, and also to give them the possibility to get more um, uh, training possibilities, um, and yeah, basically to have this safe area where they can interact. We also offer there the support and services when it comes to funding possibilities of the primary healthcare unit. So we are trying to put together a really nice package of um, services in this platform. And last but not least, um, it was mentioned before, the education aspect. Um, this is really something that shouldn't be shouldn't be underestimated. It's always the question, when is the right moment to interact really and, and to start to put the to measures into um, practice. And we have some very nice ex um, examples in Austria where universities are pioneering in the area that they are trying to um, integrate this 
team-based approach already with medical students in early at the early time of education, uh, working together with other healthcare professions, and also having this direct link into the primary healthcare units where teamwork is just one of the main characteristics. So um, this is maybe um, a tough one because it takes time until these uh, professions um, or these students actually can go out and start working and decide if they really want to do that or not. But as early as possible, it's needed that they were informed. Otherwise, they won't have the information that it's even a possibility. And something that Deepa mentioned before was um, image and reputation. And uh, here we, we have seen that it's really important uh, to increase the reputation. So we have decided to make, um, to, to integrate a specialist for uh, general medicine. So this is a new step uh, in the direction to give um, an upgrade to the status, basically. So just to summarize, um, I think that there is not one golden solution. I guess that's in no country like that. You have to have several um, strategy um, activities that you are running at the same time. Money is something that is clearly a great incentive, but it's not the icebreaker in the sense that you just need to um, put money out there and everyone will be running into the direction of primary health care. Um, we see that, especially in a, in a fragmented system, it's important to, to um, do different, uh, like, as I said, different approaches at the same time. And as example, we are currently also uh, amending um, the primary health care law, which is just important in order to uh, reduce certain bureaucratic hurdles that are they currently um, just out there in order to start a primary health care unit. Then the early approach, I mentioned it before, university settings, we need to cooperate more and um, the cooperation with the stakeholders and the community. So I think we are here in the middle of a paradigm shift and you need to be open for change and innovation. Thank you very much. Ilana, thank you so much for this great insight into uh, Austria primary care and health workforce uh, in Austria. And one of the key messages I'm taking for your presentation is actually that addressing the health workforce crisis, and in particular, the problems with primary health care is embedded in a big reform, actually. You have a big, big, big um, primary health care reform, and the health workforce crisis, so to say, a sub, the health workforce policy is, so to say, a, a subunit of this, this reform. And uh, talking about your, the primary health care units, uh, I think also very important, the working conditions you address, and you said it is a kind of win-win situation, actually, a win for the health professionals working in teams, uh, not being uh, separated or isolated, and at the same time, a win for the uh, patients having people put together, having more flexibility and, and this. And then that comes to be almost a little bit to, to, as a surprise. Uh, you were talking about the changes in the educational system that the team team training starts from the beginning, at least in some, some medical schools and facilities. I think that's quite new development and a very important one. Yeah, that's, um, uh, we have an example of a university that is trying to pioneer in that area. So it's not something that is set as a standard. It is just, um, it's starting to develop. And I think that's important. Yes, but it's very important because if you win over the academic doctors, if you win over the medical schools, you have already made a further step uh, in the improvement of the of the uh, renome of the attraction of the attractiveness of uh, primary health care. Thank you so much, Ilana. We come back to some of the things you've said in the in the in the panel discussion. Now it's my great pleasure to give uh, Pia the floor. Pia, please. Thank you, Matthias, and hello from Slovenia. So shortage of primary care physicians is one of the most pressing challenges of the health system in Slovenia too. And in a group of physicians from different settings of health system at medical chamber of Slovenia, uh, that included also young physicians, we proposed a set of interventions to make primary level more attractive to doctors and also more accessible to patients. So today I would like to highlight just a few most prominent of these proposals and also briefly mention what policies Slovenia has introduced in recent years to address this challenge. So to begin with, financial incentives, these are frequently considered as a 
potential solution for addressing the issue at hand. However, it's important to acknowledge that this approach is somewhat controversial as it may be viewed as an easy and quick fix that does not necessarily deliver the desired results when implemented in isolation. And this has today be mentioned, uh, has been mentioned by Deepa and also Il Ilana. Uh, so uh, I'm the third one highlighting this same issue. It is imperative that financial incentives be complemented with other measures such as improving working conditions and career opportunities to ensure their effectiveness. So um, it is noteworthy that primary care as a career choice remains economically inferior to many other pathways for physicians in the majority of countries. This can be a significant issue for young doctors who are in the process of establishing their families and homes. And in addition, primary care physicians also have limited opportunities for generating extra income from night shifts or working as contractors in the afternoon. Um, here, I would like also to mention that working as freelance contractor in primary care in fact conflicts with the fundamental principles of comprehensive, continuous and prevention and health promotion oriented primary care. So as we are in Slovenia actually observing this trend that more and more primary care physicians do provide um, after hours contract based services, we are trying to um, turn this trend because we are aware that it might be um, not in the in the not strengthening the primary care. So um, about financial incentives, Slovenia actually recently introduced higher basic salaries for family medicine interns compared to interns of other specializations to address the low interest of young doctors in family medicine specialization. However, this intervention did not produce the desired outcome. Furthermore, although prices for primary healthcare services were raised in the mixed capitation fee-for-service model, and the basic salary for primary care physicians was increased too, these measures did not fully succeed in satisfying family medicine specialists. The reason, uh, the reason being at their workplaces they often experience excessive workloads and insufficient time to attend to each patient adequately. Uh, so they say they are due to time constraints. Uh, they say they are not able to, to provide the type of medicine, type of services they are able to do and they would like to do. Uh, they also encounter numerous administrative tasks that are time consuming and do not directly benefit patients. So to conclude this uh, first part, uh, as it was also mentioned before, payment and wages are important, but are not the only factor. Therefore, along with in improved financial benefits, Working conditions are the next important factor for attracting and retaining primary care physicians. Some primary care specialists express a desire for the possibility of diversifying their workplace by performance, a certain set of specific, sometimes specialist services, for example, one day per week, so that they would not only stay with the set of primary care, a typical primary care services. Additionally, Many of them say that work-life balance is important and some physicians seek uh, the option of working part-time, especially young female doctors. Um, diversifying career options is also desired, including pursuing research and academic careers, engaging in public health services or in international development uh, cooperation, among others. Uh, good technical equipment is the next uh, factor essential for primary care specialists to deliver the medical services they are trained for. 
particularly in geographically remote areas. Additional diagnostics like ultrasound are desired, as many primary care specialists can perform minor surgical procedures. Also, they want to provide ultrasound guide punctures, for example, joint blocks, injections, and more. Such an approach to primary care services uh, not only gives more satisfaction to physicians, but also increases the private sector's interest in primary health care. So, uh, but to stimulate these extra services, it's crucial to clarify which services are included in the capitation sum and which are extra paid. And the price that health insurance pays for these extra services should be the same as they pay uh, to hospitals. Um, to provide patients with services that cover the majority of their health needs, uh, also multidisciplinary teams are necessary. In Slovenia, primary care services are delivered by four types of medical specialist doctors, specialists in family medicine, pediatricians, gynecologists, and specialists in occupational and sports medicine. In addition to physicians, primary healthcare teams consist of registered nurses, health technicians, and administrative staff, and community primary care centers, which serve as a basic primary healthcare units where patients can receive health services uh, under one roof. Uh, they also provide diagnostic services such, such as laboratory and basic Im imaging services, as well as community nursing, midwives, physiotherapy and neurodevelopmental services, occupational and speech therapists, mental health units, and health promotion centers that offer interventions to support people in adopting a healthy lifestyle. Uh, I mentioned registered nurses as uh, members of family medicine teams. They were gradually introduced since 2011, and there is typically 0 0.5 uh, nurse per team who takes care of well-managed chronic patients and performs screening for the most common NCDs and their common risk factors. Uh, this task sharing is necessary to ensure that physicians have sufficient time for more complex patients amid the rise of the number of chronic patients, of course. Um, Community primary care centers with multiple physician teams also offer the possibility of a more flexible organization of work. Um, however, about 20% of primary care physicians in Slovenia prefer working as private concessioners, still under the umbrella of public health care. And uh, mostly they say they prefer having more freedom in managing their practices. Yeah, you need to conclude so that we still have some time for the panel discussion. Yes. Please. So I wanted to say something also about education and training, but as there's been uh, said quite some words about this, let me just finish with the health system governance issue. So it's really important that countries know what kind of services they need in their countries and how many physicians they need in their countries according to their uh, health uh, healthcare model and to be able to keep the smart ratio between the primary care and hospital physician physicians um, some countries are introducing obligatory primary care services for physicians at the beginning of their careers but slovenia decided not to imply uh, to follow this example because we see that uh, it is not that uh, keeping these high quality standards for family medicine specialists, it's not accepted that young doctors immediately after graduation could perform comparably to family medicine specialists. And this is my now last sentence to conclude. Uh, improving the attractiveness of primary level is a common task for all health professionals at all level of healthcare, professional institutions, universities, health insurance, and other key actions uh, actors in the system. 
It requires integration of several measures across health system building blocks and only through coordinated activities, it will be possible to attract more doctors to primary care and retain them. Thank you so much, uh, Pia. Your last sentence is a perfect bridge for the webinar, which we will have in two weeks, intersectorally, intersectorality and the health workforce. But I would very rich, very rich account. And thank you so much for all the context you've been providing. And interesting to see that you played with salaries, payment mechanism, and it didn't produce the desired results. There were so many things in it. I just want to pick out two things. One very briefly, the administrative uh, workload we haven't talked about yet uh, today. But the other one is the regulatory flexibility that primary care doctors sometimes want to do more than the scope of practice allows them currently. And this is also very important for uh, remote and underserved areas, you know, where you may not find a specialist actually. And again, it would be some sort of win-win situation for patients and uh, professionals. Gemma, I had a glimpse at the chat box and I saw that there are plenty of uh, questions, comments and things coming in. We have still uh, eight, 10 minutes uh, time, bit of a challenge. Please all speakers, uh, switch on your video. Yeah, thank you, Matthias. Yeah, so the chat has been on fire. So we've had lots of really interesting comments and reflections coming in. So I think I'm going to start with a question for Deeper that we had. And I know you've answered it already in the chat, but there'll be some people that can't access that. So if you could just quickly talk again um, about some examples of longitudinal educational programs for primary health care. Um, and then after that, we have sort of some interesting reflections. I think one of the key points coming out is the importance of leadership. So clinical leadership, um, sort of both in terms of its importance for improving working conditions in the work environment, but also for sort of making careers more attractive to people thinking of entering primary care. So I just wanted to sort of ask a question, sort of, are there any examples or initiatives you can think of to ensure that a broader range of professionals in primary health care can take on these leadership roles and develop the skills that they need? Um, is this sort of an important area in your country? Um, then I think another really key point coming out is sort of improving the perception, the image, the reputation of primary health care. This is, this is coming through quite strongly. Um, so one of the things was sort of there's been a big debate about terminology, sort of calling it uh, family medicine um, instead of like general practitioners. So the importance of putting it on a par with specialists um, that came through. Um, then doing sort of adding things in research opportunities, um, conf opportunities to go to conferences, uh, international research opportunities, that sort of thing. Um, so. Just to talk if the panelists could uh, sort of reflect on that and sort of what's going on in your country, uh, that'd be quite interesting. And then a third key point was sort of around curricula. So there was some comment uh, that sort of it's too focused on sort of tertiary education and the curricula should be refocused and really centre primary health care uh, at the centre. So again, some sort of reflection on do you think that's important? Is that something you see happening in your country? And then I think a linked comment as well is it's not just primary health care. We should be shifting towards the community health model. So how do we ensure that people working in primary health care have the skills to sort of address the wider determinants of health? So Excellent points. Power. Thank you so much, uh, Gemma, for summarizing them. Deeper, have a start, please, but uh, try to be very quick. <laughs> So basically, when, when when we say longitudinal health programs, it basically means, um, you know, several different interventions over time, repeatedly, and this is really so taking different kinds of interventions, but doing them in a mix and repeatedly over time, and they can be anything from clinical placements, even just traditional medical teaching, but then more focused on on primary care instead of tertiary care skills, for example, um, peer based, uh, you know learning, um, you know, creating a community to have those peers meet regularly. So there are various, various interventions, but each of the single interventions, um, you know, in and of itself and isolated doesn't seem to have the impact that we want. We need to mix them together and we need to do them over time repeatedly. Very clear explanation. Thank you so much. Ilana. Many questions, interesting questions. So um, from my point of view, I think that the, the question really is that, um, we're in the middle of the implementation of our innovative uh, approach with the primary healthcare unit. So you mentioned academia and research. We are really 
we are really eager to understand if we really get, get it right. Like, is it really that what uh, the younger generation especially wants? Is this really the expectations they, they have uh, in the working conditions, in the team structure, all of this? And it's a bit early to really have an answer uh, to that aspect. So um, I am personally very much looking forward to also uh, hearing the opinions um, in the academia and university setting when they start uh, introducing these topics much earlier already. And um, uh, about the team structures, I think that that's somehow hitting um, the, the point. What I want to make is that we also have now included pediatricians uh, in the team. It was already in the past possible that they cooperate uh, in these primary healthcare units. Uh, but now there will, in the amendment of the law, which is not through yet, but there is the idea that uh, there will be also primary healthcare units for children. Uh, so here you have a focus um, shift a little bit. And also the possibility, let's see if that will go through, that healthcare workers can be part of the founding team, which is in Austria really revolutionizing, uh, because until now it's only uh, doctors who can found uh, primary healthcare units. Um, yes, that is basically from my point of view, we really want to understand if this is the, the right way to go, and we will see in the upcoming um, you know, months, I guess. A lot of innovation coming from Austria and we will have a close look at it and uh, we cross fingers, Ilana, that things work out as you have planned. Pia, please. Yes, so I would just like to come back a little bit to the education and training yeah. uh, because it's been raised so many times, but also because our in Slovenia uh, undergraduate medical students and young doctors expressed their desire for more training opportunities. Uh, at primary care and included the topics, uh, included this training in their undergraduate curricula. And this requires also ensuring good qualities uh, and enthusiastic primary care mentors who should, and these mentors should be properly trained uh, to have proper skills and therefore uh, it became evident that also primary care professions need their academic bodies. And Slovenia is now establishing a family medicine academic institute uh, to support research work and teaching and training in primary care. Uh, also, it was mentioned several times that these mentors in primary care should also, of course, be paid for their mentorship uh, the same as the mentors in hospitals. And this is still sometimes issue in Slovenia. So uh, the whole apparatus of the education of primary care professionals needs to be established in a country. It sounds to me, Pia, and I think uh, this resonates with what Ilana was saying earlier, there's a cultural shift ongoing and without the cultural shift, you cannot achieve it because as long as the uh, the medical profession is not really buying into primary care, you will have a lot of resistance and, and uh, barriers, actually. Gemma, one, one quick question or one quick comment from your side before I wrap up with Deepa. Yeah, well, I think I've personally found this really interesting, all the comments coming in, because I know in the UK we have huge issues around primary care. So it's kind of it's interesting to see what other countries are doing. And that sort of one final comment we had is it's really important to do surveys in countries to find out the reasons behind the challenges to get people to work in primary health care. And I think that is key. It's sort of this is all country context specific and we need to know what's going on in each individual country to come up with solutions. So workforce intelligence, foresight, forecasting and planning are really key. And I think there's really a renewed interest in these topics in, in European countries. Deepa, uh, please wrap up with me, just uh, one or two sentences. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, if there's one take home message I'd like to uh, give our audience is, you know, I think, you know, at the moment, um, you know, all of the analyses on looking at primary healthcare models really show that the, there's clear best practices around, you know, multidisciplinary teams, for example, um, ensuring, uh, you know, expanding the scope of practice of these teams to really address the basic, you know, the basic and essential health needs of the population. Most uh, health conditions should stop at primary care and not go higher. And in order to do that, we do need to increase the scope of practice. And all of these um, measures also increase the attractiveness of primary care for our health professionals. So there's a win-win there. What we want, what we need to do in terms of, you know, models of care and best practice there is at the same time, 
brings in our uh, health professionals into the primary care sectors and keeps them there. So we, you know, we need to continue investing in, in primary health care and strengthen it and, and make it more attractive for our medical students and practitioners. Thank you so much, which is a great linkage to another webinar we are planning to conduct very soon. The, the investment, where do we get the money from and uh, where should it actually uh, go? We are looking to forward to this. Thank you so much to all the speakers. Thanks, Gemma, for handling the chat box and the poll. And a big thanks also to Luthi in the background, who is uh, today um, uh, doing all the technology um, for us. And we hope to see you back next week. So stay tuned and uh, see you again. Bye. Mm -hmm.